Hello and welcome to the Australian's Money Puzzle Podcast. I'm James Kirby, the Wealth Editor at The Australian. And welcome aboard, everybody. Well, now, quick as a flash, we've moved from wondering whether there are investors back in the market to actually penalising investors, foreign investors. Uh, this week, there's been some moves uh, by the government uh, pretty quick on this issue. They're going to basically uh, lift the fees that foreign investors are charged when they leave houses empty. There's also lifting fees on when they buy established houses. And there's some trimming back of international students, which is going to change the rental dynamics. And to talk with me, and I'm delighted to say in the studio, in real life, uh, IRL uh, is Stuart Weems, friend of the show and head of Pro Solution. Well, Stuart, how are you? Uh, really well, James. And, and as you said, good to be doing this live in person. Isn't it? It's great. Yes, it's so much. It's it's very nice to be talking to, to you rather than a, a, a hologram screen. of you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And you're so much younger in real life, (laughs) (laughs) it turns out. So tell me, um, we might explain to people, first of all, why, what happened in relation to uh, immigration and foreign investment this week and how it is uh, relevant to anyone in in property and what they should be watching out for? Uh, I think it's a bit of the George Costanza principle at play here, James, Uh which is um, to pretend you're doing something whilst doing absolutely nothing. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, Of course, they're trying to frame it to ease housing affordability and the rental crisis and so forth. But the reality is that uh, foreign investors make up less than 1% of transactions. Oh, yeah, okay. So I, I think this is more of a... A tax grab rather than right. necessarily going to solve any of the problems. I mean, think about the the desire for foreign nationals to invest in Australian property. It's really about extracting in, uh, money from their domicile location, of course. Yeah. And so that's the main purpose. Not yeah. really. It's not really about sort of investment fundamentals. Yeah. So as you said, that there's two there's two costs that they've hiked in terms of the government. Mm. The first yeah. one is when they first buy the property, yeah. which at the moment you, you pay fifty five thousand dollars if you get approval as a uh, a foreigner to invest you, you in just pay that as a property set fee. It's like a regardless of the price of the place. Sort of yeah. yeah, okay. Correct. Yeah. So that'll go to almost one hundred and seventy thousand. Right. Um, and then there's a, an additional annual cost if that property is vacant. Yeah. And so, for example, a five million dollar property, you'll pay ten thousand dollars a year. Okay. Whereas they're going to double that. That's okay. sort of be twenty thousand dollars a year. Uh, I, I, I'm gathering that what you're saying to me is, if you can pay five million for a property in Australia and you don't live there, you're you're not really going to be upset. It's not going to stop you. And the whole purpose is trying to get money out of yeah. China, India, wherever it might be, okay. into a, a country that you consider to be a little bit safer. That's yeah. the main yeah. drive behind it. Yeah. Now, I don't. I've got no problem with the the policy. You know, I think we should be penalising foreigners that. Uh, are using established property and aren't renting them out. Non-productive. That, that, it's non-productive. Investment. And it's, Just using them as safe deposit boxes, as someone said to me. Think of all those yes. uh, empty apartments as safe deposit boxes in the sky. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, what about the bigger picture of a uh, bit of a clampdown on foreign students and that? Will that play into less demand for rentals in the cities? It should because yeah. um, uh, students mainly rent. You know, yeah. that, but they're not, uh, they don't, they all can't buy as well. It depends what visa that they're on. So they might not have the ability to buy a property. Um, again, it depends on their circumstances. So it will, that will ease uh, renting uh, affordability a little bit, but that's only in certain geographical okay. sectors, of course. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to be market wide. Yeah. Um, so again, the whole conversation around immigration and curtailing immigration, I think, is a good one um, and one that maybe should have happened. You know, at the end of COVID, yeah, uh, not yeah. after two or three years of yes. experiencing that. Well, there was innovation. a sense that they had to catch up, I suppose, mm. and they didn't question that until very mm. recently. Admittedly, the response has been fairly quick. Uh, mm. well, I had uh, Dina Mussina on the show, the economist at AMP, a couple of weeks ago, and she she made that point. Like from an economist point of view, the numbers were just daft; they were completely out of out yeah. of sync. And uh, it's interesting. As a sensitive issue, you've got to be very careful how you deal with this as a politician, very, very careful considering what's going on around the world. But um, it seems to be beginning to be managed. Uh, I suppose from an investment point of view, the big question is, we did about 7% on house prices last year and the consensus is that we'll do 3 to 5% this year. Where do you sit with that? Do you think that's more or less on, on target? 
I think I think so. I don't yeah. really have a firm view. Unlike yeah. previous years, you might recall in late November last year, I wrote a piece in the yeah. wall section to say, "Look, we're at the bottom of the market." So you I did, wasn't, you I wasn't, did, you were, and you were. Uh, it wasn't consensus, that's for sure. No, and it, yeah. so I wasn't particularly surprised um, that we saw a bit of growth this year. Uh, what will next year hold? Uh, I think it's a it's interesting discussion. Interesting discussion of how persistent inflation will be, mm. which will then inform us of how persistent um, interest rates will be, yeah. and in fact whether the RBA could hike again, which is not a, an impossibility. It's not impossible, but then at the same time, some people who are, would listen to are saying inflation's falling, like it's really falling, mm. um, and maybe the point is how far does it go? Because it rolled up very high. But if we sat at fours and fives, perhaps people could deal with that easily enough. That would actually be a kind of a, a normal, historically normal picture. Yeah. And then the other the, the other thing which is particularly important for the property market is employment and, yeah. and the unemployment yeah. rate. And again, with heightened interest rates, you know, does does that really damage the economy, slow it to that extent? Yeah. So I don't think we're going to see a runaway market for the same, for similar reasons uh, that I had the view last year, which is really a supply demand mm. reason. Demand is low, below mm. average, but supply is well below average as well. So I'm guessing you're thinking the trend is upwards that it's 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 going to be rising property market, but you, you wouldn't put a number on it. No, yeah, well I, I'm not even sure it's going to be rising, James. Okay. I wouldn't be okay. surprised if we <clears throat> saw slight. Movements, you know, two or three percent downwards right. next year. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the range is quite rot wide next year. It could be really negative three, positive seven. Right. Um, and I guess that's completely sitting on the fence. And I yeah, well, no, that. in a way, well, yes, but no. You've given us a range, and it's interesting because a couple of people um, have SQM research had a minus three possibility in Sydney, for instance. And at the time, that was sort of like, mm. wow, no one else is saying that. So. Um, the range is quite uh, broad at the moment in terms of forecasts, and some the forecasts do go into the negative. So it's interesting we'll put that on the table that that's possible. The other thing I want to talk about with you, you've done some really interesting work on everyone's favourite issue, Sydney versus Melbourne. Or should I say <laughs> Melbourne versus Sydney? Um, but the facts are the facts, folks. And uh, I might get Stuart just to distill some of the work he's done recently about this. And why Sydney basically wins, ironically, because Melbourne is the growing city, but mm. Sydney wins as it, if, you, if you invest over very substantial periods of time now. So what, what have you found out? So if you look at the average growth in median house prices over the last 10 years, in Sydney, it's over eight. Uh, in Melbourne, it's just over five. So we have a 3% differential over a decade period. It's more stark over five years, 6% versus 2% uh, approximate. So uh, just just for, for, for listeners, just to, to basically soak that up now. So what you're saying is Melbourne is growing at only 2% a year and Sydney's growing at three times that, 6% a year per annum for how long? Over the last five years. Over the last five years. And that's that's that's. That's taking in the hail, rain and shine there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Really, yeah, COVID, a bit of a boom, a bit of a retracement. Yep. yep. Yeah, all conditions. And when you look at population growth, you know, population growth is very strong in in Melbourne, which would normally inform around demand and supply of housing, given yeah. it's been well yeah. documented. So the textbook would suggest Melbourne should be should be outpacing it. It's got faster growing. Yes. Population. Yes. Yeah. When you look at the share of investors, though, which yeah. which typically only make up about a, a third of the market, and, okay. and you wouldn't want them to make up much more than that. Yeah. Um, the the share of uh, borrowing to invest uh, for Melbourneites has held steady over the last ten to fifteen years, where it's been rising in Sydney. And about almost forty to forty five percent of investors are investing in Sydney. Right. Uh, uh, that's uh, you know across the board from a from a national perspective. So so again, what we're saying here is that it's not just Sydney people investing in Sydney. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, turning that, framing that in a different way, uh, there's certainly investor numbers certainly aren't growing in Melbourne, which is which is yeah. a problem. So you could probably point to some obvious things there: tightening in tenancy laws, the, the recent hike in land tax, yes. these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe people have been put off by, you know, how well the economy is doing or the the debt situation, and, mm. and maybe imputing what that might um, that might 
create moving yeah. forward in terms yeah. of housing price growth, but the differential is pretty stark. Well, it's not, whatever else it is, it is not an investment, it's not a, a regime in Victoria that is uh, actively encouraging investment. No. Uh, and uh, that would seem to be reflected in the figures. Um, I suppose the million dollar question is, uh, uh, from a demographic point of view, we know mm. that actually Melbourne is growing faster than Sydney. We know that it's growing faster every year. And we know that sooner or later, where once upon a time there was a, a substantial gap in the populations of the two cities, that they're going to level up uh, in five, seven years time. But does that mean this is going to change or is it safe to say that Sydney's always better for a bunch of reasons? And one of those reasons, obviously, is it's really tight. And there's these suburbs that are basically surrounded by water and they are geographically basically autonomous. And so it's an investors have a field day in all these various points and peninsulas that, that, uh, that everyone loves to live in. No, Frank did a, a, some research. They do, in fact, they do it every year um, to derive the premium, the waterfront property premium. Right. And so they they arrived last year that it's one hundred and eighteen percent in Sydney, um, which which what does is that mean? Much which means the waterfront property with either water views or yeah. proximity to water will attract a one hundred and eighteen percent premium price premium. Okay. On a per square meter basis, compared to something that doesn't, it doesn't have, have it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, it's that's a lot higher than a lot of other countries. I, I can't right? quote them off the top of my mind, but yeah. normally it's like. Um, thirty to fifty percent. Yeah. So, so Sydney certainly is attracting that premium. I guess that's reflecting in the median house price. It depends as well. on what you're looking at, Stuart. I mean, yeah. you could be by the water in I don't know. Uh, you could be <laughs> by the water somewhere, you know, in 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 the Maine or you know Brittany, uh, and it's all very well. But it probably may not be particularly pretty looking out. Mm. Uh, it's spectacular looking out in Sydney. That's one thing I suppose, uh, and it. it, it it has that that premium factor, as you say, and ninety. If I've got it right, I think it's ninety three percent of the Victorian coastline is public park. We don't have suburbs on the water yes. as such. Uh, almost nothing. Yep. And so that isn't there. There's a few. There's a few in Sydney. I think what it does do is remind us as uh, property investors to find properties or invest in properties that have some uniqueness and scarcity yes, element. Yeah, yeah. And if we're just investing in properties that are just located in any old suburb mm. with a very benign streetscape and, you know, there's nothing unique about the property mm. that, we're, you know, in the long run, your growth rate's probably going to reflect that. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's probably the best the best thing that I can glean from that. I, I think Sydney's house price, the, the, the relative value of Sydney – Sydney's median to, to Melbourne is is almost at all time highs. Yes, right. It's about one point six five percent. That is that Sydney's median is one point one point six five percent higher than Melbourne. Um, I think there's always going to be a price differential. It almost yeah. got down to one to one about fifteen years ago, um, and at that that's gap, right. Briefly in the early two mm, thousands, I wonder what was happening there. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that just informs us about the relative. Yeah. growth of those different markets. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing too would be able to say, well, maybe Melbourne's in in line for a bit of mean reversion. You know, maybe uh, we've had some <laughs> underperformance maybe. and, and uh, you know, mm. those those, uh, those returns will always revert to the mean. Yeah. But Perth is showing a bit of that at the moment. Mm. Well, yeah. Perth had 15 years of no growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's no surprise that it's taken off, and I think it's only just starting. Uh, okay. I, can, I can imagine that that market will be well ahead in 10 years from now. Right. Very interesting. We'll take a short mm. break. We'll be back in a moment. Hello. Welcome back to the Australian's Money Puzzle podcast. I'm James Kirby, the Wealth Editor at The Australian. I'm with Stuart Weems of ProSolution, friend of the show, regular contributor to The Australian, author, financial advisor, many other things. <laughs> Uh, and very good uh, podcast guest, as you could uh, reasonably expect. I've got some interesting questions. Uh, this is on Victoria again. Uh, there's no, n we don't mean to have it uh, all about Victoria today, but to just so how, how it runs uh, in the nature of the questions that come in. And I think we should have dealt with this. It's, it's uh, something we have not dealt with much at all. It's from Peter. He says, uh, with the Victorian government's desperate attempts, I quote, 
this is verbatim, uh, to fund its ever-growing debt. It looks like the Palace land tax legislation, Palace being Tim Palace, the Victorian treasurer, will pass. There's an assumption that holiday homes will be exempt if occupied for four weeks. That's right, Peter. But little detail on the mechanics of how this would work. Could you or a guest expand what it all means and that people don't get slugged with the new tax if they had a holiday home in Victoria. Yeah, okay. Never advice, remember, always information. I mean, can't Peter just go there for four weeks or can't he, can't he sign a document to say he was there for four weeks? Are the Victorian government going to be kind of snooping in the bushes, making sure, counting people going in and out? How are they going to, how would they run this? Um, probably. I've had interaction with the SRO where I had to provide five years of water bills to Aye. demonstrate uh, ah. property usage. So, uh, yeah. What's the, the SRO? The State Revenue Office, okay. which is the, the body that um, deals with land tax. And, yes, yes. Or, and stamp duty and all those sorts of things. Um, the problem with the, in Victoria is you've got to um, make sure you understand which tax we're talking about because there's two taxes at play here. <laughs> for holiday homes. Uh, for, for holiday homes and in relation Our to this homes. question, there's, yeah. a, there's a vacant residential land tax, yep. which is 1%, if, yes. if your property is vacant for more than six months. Yes. And then there's the new temporary land tax surcharge, and we better put temporary in an right. inverted right. marks there. Um, it's the vacant residential land tax that yeah. you avoid if you occupy your property for four weeks. Okay. It doesn't have to be four consecutive weeks, just four weeks during okay. the calendar year, in mm -hmm. which case then you can avoid that 1% surcharge. Right. But the new um, temporary... Yep. surcharge uh, you can't avoid. Right. So even if you occupy that holiday house, mm. um, you, you can claim a, a tax-free threshold uh, on your primary place of residence, of yeah. course. Yeah. So one property, but you can't do it on two properties. Right. So if that's your second property, you're paying yeah. land tax. I see. So basically it's a, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a very targeted tax uh, aimed particularly at people who have a second house, yep. inescapable to some degree, and don't be flippant about staying the four weeks because they can measure these things these days. They'll, they'll be all over it. They'll days. be all over it. And, and, you know, James, the other <laughs> thing too is that land tax notices will start to be sent out at the end of January. Right. Um, January, February. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the market does. You know, yeah, because yeah. There, there'll be, I'm sure there's plenty of people that haven't heard or yeah. don't understand yeah. or, you know, don't Or we'll don't say, like, like they've said in the investment in the city, they've said, that's it, I'm out. Yep. Like this was line ball. Yep, that's it. This is an emotional response where they just, yeah. Yep. So I'll okay. be interested to see what, you know, yeah. what, what that happens. What you know, what what impact on the market they'll have. I'll be interested to see. They probably all want to have their holidays first, mind you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Lucas. I understand from an earlier podcast that you can claim interest from purchasing shares through a home loan on your tax return. Have I got this correct? Okay, Lucas, and all the Lucases in the world. It's not uh, uh, never personal. Remember. Uh, first of all, you can claim, you can negatively gear shares. That's the essential point to make. I uh, will deal with the home loan in a minute. He also says, if it's true, can you explain how I would set up this arrangement to happen? Okay. Um, what we were talking about uh, on the day of that podcast was uh, you can negatively gear shares. Bizarrely, most people don't know and don't do it anymore. Though, you know, really, um, there's a dividend yield of four and a half every year, year after year after year. Um, then we made the point that uh, with, with when people are negatively gearing um, shares or property, they don't have to take the first home loan that comes in the door for investors, and they can use their mortgage uh, if they wish when they're doing that. But how they do it, of course, the mechanics of it is, is tricky. So to the straight question, can you claim interest from purchasing shares through a home loan? Yes or no? Uh, uh, yes is the technical answer. Would you do it? Absolutely not. Um, right. So, so you yeah. must never mix purposes, particularly deductible and non-deductible yeah. purposes. Yeah. And so one of the complications is the onus is on you, the taxpayer, to prove to the ATO yeah. what your deduction is. If you can't prove that beyond doubt, they'll yes. just deny the deduction. Yes, right? so yeah. The burden is on you. When you mix purposes and you make a repayment then against that loan, mm. the law says that you have to apportion that repayment. Yeah. So if I've got a home loan for $100 and an investment loan for 50 all in one yeah, 150 yeah. loan and I repay some, yeah. I'm going to be forced to repay some of that yes. tax deductible yeah. debt, which yeah. I won't want to do. 
So always split it out. And it's and, and being pragmatic, you can sit down at a table and work it out. Mm. And you can you can you can structure your finances in a fashion that you don't that you can use your home loan for purposes other than the home loan. That's entirely legit. Yes. The issue is when you're doing your tax, you must you must uh, match. They must correspond your deduction and your and your loan. So if yes. you're claiming X on the loan, it must be for the investment. That's Absolutely, it. that's it basically. Isn't Absolutely. It? And, and it a muddies the water if you mix those mm. purposes and reduces, you know, it gives the ATO I think a greater yeah. proposition to deny the deduction. So if you're borrowing for investment purposes, you must always do it in a separate loan. That that would yeah. be my advice. Yeah. And it's as simple as just going to the bank and saying, I've got equity in my home. Mm. I want to establish a second mortgage, which isn't a second mortgage in terms of registered mortgage, but a yeah. second account yeah. that is secured by my um, property. And, and then what, um, because loans are, are called what, what's called fully drawn advances, they, they have to, they've got to give you all the money when the loan is set up. Yeah. So let's go, say I go and borrow $100,000 mm. and use my home as security. They'll put that hundred. They'll give me that hundred thousand dollars in my account. Yeah. So what I should do the next day is take that hundred thousand and repay it all but a hundred dollars mm. into the home loan. So I reduce the balance of the, yeah. the new investment loan to a hundred dollars. Then every time that I want to invest in the share market, I redraw, which yes. you can do online. It's very yes. simple. Yeah. And so if I invest ten thousand dollars today, I'll redraw ten thousand dollars, and that's what I'll use to settle that mm. trade. Mm. And that way there's a perfect connection between the loan purpose and use, the redraw. Yes. And you can audit and it then yourself. The I mean, you can track it yourself. You don't get mixed up. Yes. Uh, which is easy for people and very difficult when you turn around to do your tax returns at the end of the year. And the tax office isn't wanna, doesn't want to hear about how you got mixed up. <laughs> no. Uh, so, and at yeah. least you've got one statement then at the end yeah, of the financial year yeah, to say, yeah. this is the interest charge in respect to that loan. And you mm. know, or you can prove that mm. loans only been used to invest in shares. Really it's a good, good way to do it. Really good. Uh, uh, so keep that in mind, folks. It's, uh, you know, it's a question of sitting down and working it out. Uh, uh, so the point that uh, the original question on Lucas's uh, concept is correct. Uh, and the broader point is that you can move things around. You, you know, you, you, as long as you do everything legitimately, you can just be smart with the rates you're paying when, in different areas and optimize that sort of combination. Okay, we'll take a short break. We have a final question from Liam. Hello, welcome back to the Australian's Money Puzzle podcast. I'm James Kirby, the wealth editor at The Australian, talking to Stuart Weems of ProSolution. And we have one final question, which is short, but it's a big issue. Really big issue. I've been writing about it this week. It's from Liam, L-I-A-M, Liam. Can it be a good idea, once you're above preservation age, to draw down on super to pay off your mortgage? I had a, I had a call this morning from someone who wasn't very happy with the piece I did about reverse mortgages this week. Understandably, it was from someone in the reverse mortgage game. Yes. And they made the point, oh, you know, you said this, you said that, et cetera. But uh, I, once things cooled down a little and we were actually talking, uh, he made the point that uh, once upon a time, very few people retired with a mortgage. I think it was like 10%, something like that. And now it's approaching one third of all retirees going in with a mortgage. Uh, and then, of course, the, the point being that maybe a reverse equity, reverse mortgage deal was a way out of that, which I suppose it is a way out of it. Um, but more broadly, on, on, on this issue from Liam about super and mortgage and the interplay between the two, First things first, I suppose, brass tax. Should you should it be the case that you should always try not to have a mortgage when you're retired? Is that a home loan? Is in a, a for a, a, an a mortgage? Loan? Yes. I, I don't mean As an investment, investment mortgage. Yes. I mean a yeah. home loan mortgage. Absolutely non deductible. Yeah, that yeah. would be you know if I was advising a client, that would be my almost my number one. So that would be a principle. Yes. Yeah. 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 If 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 you can, don't have a mortgage when you're retired. Yeah. Unless there was a, a very clear downsizing strategy, mm. you know, unless it was a case of I'm going to retire at 60 and then I'm going to downsize at 65, yeah. for example. But I'd be very careful about that because people can change their mind. They don't want to leave the community they're in, their yeah. friends and so forth. So if it was downsized in the same area and we were very confident it was going to be a downsize in, in terms of purchase price as well and yeah. you're going to withdraw equity and repay debt – then you might you might say okay I'm happy to keep the loan for five years, mm. but if it's a long term strategy with no downsizing, I think yeah. we'd want zero zero uh, mortgage. And would then naturally lead on to would it make sense in most cases if to reduce your super core super 
uh, if you uh, take a lump sum out to repay a mortgage? I think that's going to depend on uh, how much you have in super and yeah. how much you need to fund living expenses. Yeah. Um, and well, then well, you, what would the guidance be? Would it be the less you have, the more you should do it? Um, because you well, get access to the pension on the other side. Yeah, potentially, that's yeah. right. Mm. Um, because, it, yeah, that's right, you increase uh, your Centrelink benefits. Um, but also if you had a lot, for example, you might take the view that the long-term returns, depending on how it's invested, are going to be yeah. um, greater, particularly because it's tax-free, yes. greater than what the home loan interest rate might be as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think it's it's something that you certainly need to get some advice yes. about. A yeah. and, and talking about reverse mortgages, James, I haven't read the piece, but... Um, as a general rule, I've not been, I have not favoured reverse mortgages. Mm. Um, so if anyone's considering doing something like that, I, I think it's well worth yeah. you know, paying for some uh, and, the, and the piece there. I wrote was very much on that, you know, know what you're doing, be very careful, mm. understand that the interest compounds mm. uh, and that the, you know, the amount of basically your house that you hand over could be much more than you thought at the start. Now, in their defence, what this uh, industry um, executive said to me this morning was, we have an exemplary record on regulation and ASIC are very happy with the sector and everyone's happy with the sector. And we haven't had the, in recent years, we haven't had the, the bad stories that were there in the past or overseas. That was their defense. What do you think of that? Uh, it's a very small industry, a very small sector. You know, yeah. I, I think reverse mortgages uh, probably came out about 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and they started to gather some pace before the GFC, but yeah. then they they really wound back, and a yeah. lot of a lot of provided ex providers exited the market. Yeah. So you don't have a lot of mortgage brokers trying to sell um, reverse mortgages, oh, which yes. is, which is a good thing, by right. the way. We don't right. want we yeah. don't want that. So there's not a lot of incentive for people to sell these things. Yeah. Um, which again is is a is a good thing. So that's probably you know they're probably a drop in the ocean. That's why that they they are. But you know they're getting bigger. Um, the government scheme, which was renovated and upgraded, used to be called the pension loan scheme. It's now called the home equity access yes. scheme. That's up about sixty percent in terms of participants in a year. Yep. And the some of the operators, like Household Capital, which is one of the big operators, it's putting together a billion dollar securitization package now, and it says it can run up to ten billion. Wow! So it's getting bigger. Yes. Uh, and I think it's getting bigger quite fast, off a small base, as you say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully that's useful to you, Liam. I imagine it is, and to everybody. We might come back to that if you're interested. Let me know. Drop an email, and the email is nice segue to that. The money puzzle at the Australian.com.au. All right. Thank you very much. Great to have a person IRL in real life in the <laughs> studio, the real life Stuart Weems, uh, with us today. Thank you very much. We'll be back with you soon.